dose, if it is a double dose regime, or 800 million doses if we use the single dose regime, of which there is only currently one supplier who does single dose, which is Johnson & Johnson. The African Union leadership were apprised of this challenge back in August. And that's when they set up the Africa Vaccine Acquisition Task Force. Our mission was to engage the donor community, uh, including the White House. Uh, I spoke at the time with the White House uh, uh, President, uh, under President Trump, and we continued those engagements. After that, we have engaged with partners and nations around the world over our making sure they understand what our needs are. Our leadership decided in November after engagements with the donor community that COVID, our understanding by November was that COVAX could only do 20%, uh, which would be a third of our target. Our clinicians like Dr. John made it absolutely clear that if we only achieve 20% vaccination of the African people, we would live permanently with this disease. And it would, we would now be dependent on a process of natural selection or natural community, herd immunity. Uh, so the African leaders decided that if that was the case, then they must go out and buy vaccines themselves. And it was not because we wanted to compete with COVAX. It was because we were told COVAX could not achieve. The donors were not willing to provide the funding for us to get to 60%. So we accepted that. Uh, the African leaders met with uh, President Macron, representing the donors, uh, in November and December, and pleaded with him to engage the other countries to meet us at least halfway, to, get, to push their commitments to at least 30% of our population, which would be half of our target. Uh, President Macron confirmed that they would indeed get to 30% as a minimum target. I'm not going to relitigate where we are. I'm going to focus now on what we as the African Union are doing. So our own target was to achieve enough vaccines for 400 million people. We engaged all the suppliers who were authorized by the WHO, including the Chinese and the Russian suppliers. We met with them all. And as I've pointed out before, the challenge has been the availability of vaccines, not the availability of money. Uh, in by November, the African uh, Union, uh, the AVAT task force, had already secured two billion dollars, equivalent to what the United States has put into Covax. We had two billion dollars by November. That money was provided by the Afriexim Bank, an African institution, funded primarily by African countries, the largest single shareholders being Nigeria and Egypt. 10 finance ministers of the African Union members met and increased the capital of the African Union, of, of the, of the Afri-Exim Bank, sorry, in order for it to have the capacity to finance direct vaccine acquisitions. I consider that to be one of the most important meetings in modern Africa. When African countries came together 
We had all the finance ministers, all the health ministers, and we said, we will buy vaccines and we will buy them with our own money. And then the African Union itself, at its annual meeting in January, issued a resolution calling on the African member states who are financiers of the Afriexim Bank to increase its capital base to enable it to fund. That resolution is available for anyone to observe. It shows our own determination to drive our own destiny. So we, having secured the funding, we engaged Johnson and Johnson. As I've explained to you before, the reason we, we engaged Johnson and Johnson was that they are the only one of the major suppliers who had an agreement to produce from the African continent. It was clear to us by January that vaccine nationalism was being played out over production assets. That is where it is played out. The countries with the production assets control the, pro the release of vaccines. So we at least could rely on one production asset, which was on African soil, which was the Aspen facility, uh, which the ambassador rightly pointed out, they are supporting. But the Aspen facility was already at a position to deliver 300 million doses uh, of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So President Ramaphosa, as the African Union chair, led the negotiations. Myself and John Kengastong here, we were members of the committee that negotiated with Johnson & Johnson. And Johnson & Johnson, like all the suppliers, wanted upfront payment, uh, a bank guarantee. We provided all that to, this, to the level of 2 billion US dollars. Uh, and our order with them is made up of two parts. It is a 400 million dose order, which when delivered by September next year, starting next week, all shipments begin next week. And when we have completed the delivery of the Johnson & Johnson shipments, we will have achieved 30% which is 50% of the set target with the hope that the donor community now led by the United States will meet us halfway for the other 30%. So really the good news from my side is this. Commencing next week, we will ship 6 million doses of Johnson & Johnson vaccines for the July-August period. Uh, these are single-dose vaccines. They'll go to 27 African countries that have already paid for their vaccines. An additional 18 African countries are in the process of finalizing their uh, loans from uh, the World Bank. We are meeting again with the World Bank tomorrow. Uh, they have committed to fully funding those countries that need funding support. So we expect that by the end of August, 45 countries will have uh, completed their first shipments. Thereafter, Johnson & Johnson will be shipping from the Aspen facility on average 10 million single dose vaccines, 10 million September, 10 million October, 10 million December. In January, we move to 20 million a month and we will continue exponentially increasing that until all 400 million doses have been delivered by September next year. 
So we have, as the AVAT, uh, as AVAT, we have institutionalized ourselves. The union has authorized us to turn AVAT into a standing permanent structure uh, for purchasing of vaccine now and in future. The AVAT is now called the Africa Vaccine Acquisition Trust. That was the special purpose vehicle which was set up to fund the purchase of vaccines. So it's now, we are now trustees of that with members of our leadership. The AVAT vehicle is the vehicle for vaccine acquisition uh, partnerships. That's why in statements now you see AVAT rather than Africa CDC. Africa CDC is a member of AVAT. Uh, so the AVAT vehicle continues to look for opportunities to acquire additional vaccines. Let me conclude by talking about Pfizer and the production side. As I've pointed out before, in my capacity as the African Union Special Envoy, I am a volunteer. I'm a volunteer businessman. I said, I'm not in this industry. I was invited by President Ramaphosa to do this job because I did the same job during the Ebola crisis. So I have spent the last year working full-time on this. I advised, I advised my presidents. I advised my presidents that we need production capacity now. Uh, if we don't have production capacity, if this crisis comes back, we'll be in the same position. In the last few weeks, President Ramaphosa and the AVAT team have been engaged with the European governments about the delivery of vaccine substance rather than vaccine donations. We want substance to the factories. So the Europeans have agreed to ship vaccine substance to our facility in Aspen. So the, the facility in Aspen, which was previously taking drug substance from the United States' is emergent facility, will is producing these vaccines that I have mentioned from uh, vaccine substance delivered from Europe. This is a result of very successful negotiations between President Ramaphosa and his counterpart, uh, President Ursula von der Leyen. And we really appreciate this partnership from Europe because it, it is fundamental to our approach, which is we want to ramp up production on the continent, which means we want drug substance to also begin to flow. We won't solve this permanently through donations. We have to have a sustainable approach to production. The, we were in negotiations with Pfizer. We had a lot of difficulty negotiating with Pfizer. I, I tell you straight as it is, we had a lot of difficulties. Uh, finally, we called off the negotiations. The chairman of Pfizer called me, Albert Bola. I, I commend him. He called me. He said, I'm sorry, this worked out this way. How do we fix this? He's the only one of the pharma chairmen who did that. He said, I want to fix this. Help me understand what the problem is. So we discussed it extensively. I, 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 I informed President Ramaphosa, who also got engaged. He came back to us and he said, I'm going to the White House to see how we can do this. So we feel very much that the decision uh, of the United States to work with Pfizer to purchase vaccines is something that is a game changer in all this, okay? Further, I told Albert Bola that they must produce from the African continent. 
He called me and he said, my board has approved your proposal that we produce from the African continent. So they will be producing 100 million doses a year from the BioVac facility, uh, another vaccine producer based in, in Africa. But we are not stopping there. We want to make clear to all suppliers, as I have told them, that if you want a long-term future with us now, you produce from Africa. We don't mind, you can, if you want land, we'll give you. If, if you want to own everything 100%, we, we don't mind, just produce from the African continent. Because when we got into trouble this time, it was because there was no production from the African continent. The countries that had production, whether it was India, the United States, Europe, Japan, they all restricted shipments. So now we are pleased to see that Johnson and & Johnson and Pfizer have made commitments to ship from Africa. We, however, want to make it clear that we prefer that they license producers in Africa rather than to produce under contract. Because we want to be treated the same way as they produce in India, okay? Uh, if they can produce under license in India, they should be able to produce under license in Africa, but we leave these to be purely commercial negotiations between the parties. I'm not involved in those things. So to summarize, the African Union has purchased 400 million doses. 220 million have been paid for. 180 million is an option we trigger in September if the orders have come in. I'm pleased to say that African countries have ordered and placed pre-orders in excess of 400 million doses. This demonstrates that they are willing to pay for their vaccines. They are willing to stand together and they are willing to fight this disease. So the, and for that, we are extremely grateful. We have entered into an agreement with UNICEF to act as our distributor. They did not do the purchasing on our behalf. They act as the distributors. So as I'm speaking now, UNICEF have began to receive instructions from us to collect doses from the factory at Aspen and to begin to move them to the various countries. I will stop there to allow us to have a discussion. Unfortunately, today I won't be able to stay throughout, uh, but I am pleased to, to pick up on these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Mr. Strive Masiwa, who is the AU Special Envoy on COVID-19 and uh, coordinator of the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Force, which, as he said, has now been transformed into a trust. Uh, very significant developments uh, there. Thank you very much. Now we move on, on to your questions. And the very first person to ask a question was Elana Gordon, who is with the world from GBH and PRX, a national radio show in the United States. And she says, my question is, and this is to Dr. John, Niger has not experienced many cases of COVID-19. Is this a unique outlier? And if so, what can the rest of the region learn about the virus from this situation? Do you think that it is possible that the country will be able to avoid an outbreak altogether, that the situation is uniquely hostile to COVID-19, or do you worry about cases growing there? And this is in reference to Niger. Dr. John, that is for you. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne, and uh, <clears throat> the, the reporter. Um, I, I just want to say that uh, we have to take a very close look at, at Niger and other countries uh, across the continent that find themselves in a, a similar uh, a situation to understand what is going on in the country and what are some of the factors that might be leading to that. Is it uh, a, a natural a process? 
uh, meaning that are, those, are there any factors that are making the, the, the situation look stable? Or uh, is it under reporting of the, of the cases? Uh, there are so many things that we need to look at from epidemiologically and make sure that science guides us into drawing the conclusions there. I think that is one. <clears throat> the second thing is that uh, it's a general warning I've had uh, for this, uh, for our continent from the beginning. This is a very treacherous virus. I'm a virologist for over three decades. And viruses will tend to give you that false sense of complacency, see itself into the population, and then explode. We've seen this in across the continent, in Liberia, in many countries, that even Uganda, Uganda started off with very low numbers. And then, of course, uh, you see where the, it is now. I mean, Namibia and, and others. So, so again, a very cautionary uh, uh, word here to any country that is seeing low numbers. Let's um, <clears throat> use the, the full power of epidemiology to understand what is going on before we jump into conclusions. But be careful. This is a dangerous virus. It's a treacherous virus. And we just don't know how it will um, pan out. It may be delayed epidemic or outbreaks in Niger, but I, they, at this point, it's very dangerous to conclude that they have an unusual situation. Thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> colleagues, I'm going to ask you, um, as we've done when we are um, in a tight uh, corner because of time, please uh, stick to one priority question per person so that we can accommodate as many as we can. All right, now let me welcome Gabriel Steinhauser from the Wall Street uh, Journal. Gabrielle, good morning. Please go ahead with your question. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, what, what is the realistic target for African countries to um, achieve in terms of their population being vaccinated by the end of this year, given the supply agreements and promises currently in place? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, who is your question targeted at? I think it's for Dr. John. Dr. John. A realistic target, I mean, uh, Gabriela, is that we are aiming to uh, immunize, and we still remain uh, focused with that, that we should be able to uh, uh, use science to drive our targets, which is we need to get at least 25 to 30% of our, 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 our population vaccinated. Uh, if we have to fight this pandemic and get uh, make sure that it doesn't get into endemicity, we are still very focused on that. If we listen to the numbers that um, Mr. Masiwa uh, put out there, and we also factor in the, um, the, the, the bilateral donations that Ambassador Lapen mentioned and other projections that we are having, that it is very possible that we can achieve that target if the vaccines truly start rolling out in, in August and scale up in, in September and November. It is very, very doable there. I think, however, we have to be very careful that as vaccines are, are beginning to um, roll out on the continent, we also have the capacity to increase ability to roll out the vaccination. We've always maintained that vaccine plus vaccination equals life safe and economy safe. So again, we, are, we remain very optimistic that we will be able to uh, if the vaccine, if we have a predictable supply of vaccines, we should be able to roll them out uh, uh, and get to at least thirty percent of our population by the end of the year. Um, John, John and I work together, so sometimes we're like twins, so we can uh, we can contradict each other. Uh, uh, he's given you a dimension to this. I'm going to give you the numbers. The most guaranteed position that we have right now on delivery of vaccines is what I just gave you, the AVAT delivery. Okay, we've paid for it. The production is there. Uh, we have 45 million doses to be delivered by the end of December. Okay, that's 45 million people. Okay, so you can, you can run that number, 45 million. Okay, the US government has kindly committed around 25 million doses at present, okay? Um, and I have them all in, I have everything in my head, okay? 13, uh, roughly 15 million of that are double dose, okay? The other 10 are Johnson & Johnson, 
at the present moment. So you can run the number, seven and a half million plus 10, that's 17 and a half million plus 45 million. If the United States, and I have no reason to believe they, should, they, they will not achieve this, they are the United States. Uh, we don't know what portion of the 500 global announced is for Africa. But let us assume for a moment that it's 50%. Ambassador, we want at least 50%. And you know that I have been saying that. If so, let's assume that the US government gives us 50% of the 500. That's 250 million doses, 125 million people vaccinated. That's not gonna happen between September and December, impossible, okay? And even if it did, the absorptive capacity of a Pfizer vaccine is much harder. It's going to be to more limited countries because we don't have in place the full cold storage infrastructure for the ultra cold chain required around Pfizer. But let's assume that that 250 million is delivered over 12 months to September, uh, say to September to September next year, okay? Maybe that's circa another 20 million a month, okay? So certainly the US commitment is 50-50 where we are as Africa, okay? We love that. It's a 50-50 partnership. Uh, we've been meeting with the US uh, diplomats, John and I and uh, some of our colleagues. We meet with your people almost every week. We talk about the distribution, the deliveries and so forth. It's the best part of the partnership. Now, COVAX, we haven't written them off, okay? Uh, so let's look at what COVAX can deliver. They were supposed to deliver 700 by the end of the year. They have delivered, give or take, 60 million doses, okay? Double dose regime around the AstraZeneca Covishield vaccine from India. Now, everything now depends on India. Does India open up? to deliver, to allow the Indian manufacturers to release the vaccines. Because COVAX uh, can only rely on the Indian supplies. And those are being politically uh, restricted. It's not the manufacturers, uh, but it's, the, it's, it's political. Now, India's position is not different from other countries. So let's not, I'm not gonna bash India on the head. We, we've been meeting with Indian diplomats, uh, as about pushing them to say, please release the vaccines to COVAX, that COVAX has paid for, so that we can get our distribution, okay? Because again, contrary to what people may think, we meet regularly with COVAX. Uh, and we, there's no day that goes by without some communication between us and the COVAX guys. We're critical of things that have been done, but we work with them, okay? Uh, you can criticize me if I go wrong, but we can work together, okay? And we work very well with Dr. Seth Berkeley, explaining to him our sources of frustration and the problems that we see. And we go out to try even to uh, uh, force the hand on them. So the position is very clear. There's no possibility that we can vaccinate 60% of the African population by December. Impossible. Not as things stand, okay? Uh, could we achieve it by September next year, August, September next year, with the current availability of vaccines? That's our best hope. We can only speak from the African Union perspective that whether or not donors come to the table, we will do our very best with our meager resources to take our continent to 60%. But we appreciate the extraordinary commitment of the Biden-Harris administration. Sorry for the longevity, but I hope that covers a bit of ground for some of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now we move on with our questions. And uh, the next one is for the ambassador. And it is coming from Kara Anna of the Associated Press. So Kara says, what is the country by country breakdown? 
for the 25 million vaccine doses that the United States is donating to the African Union and how many of the 500 million Pfizer doses committed by the U.S. are going to African countries? Thanks very much. Um, so as, as Strad said, on the 500 million, there is not yet a determination. Um, we know that is of huge interest. And frankly, I think in terms of both your questions, we understand the, the huge interest, the bottom line being, when will, when will a particular country or community get vaccinated? So on the 500 million, I don't yet have an answer. We, we're still working that through. Um, on, on the issue of allocations more broadly for the, this first 25 million, um, we did the allocation in close partnership with, with Strive, with Dr. John, um, and also with, with national government. We looked at criteria around the epidemic, around national programs, what vaccines did they already have, what were they using, um, what was the level of vulnerability, and on the basis of inputs like that, um, reached a, a proposed allocation that was then offered. Um, countries then took up the offer, and in the vast, vast majority of countries, indeed, they, they took up the offer that the, the U.S. through um, AVAT and uh, African Union and Africa CDC put on the table. Um, and, and now, as I say, they are, are rolling out. The, the specific numbers, um, I don't have all of them at this point. Those, um, we have the numbers, which we're happy to provide you for the deliveries that have already been made. And in the other cases, um, I just basically, as deliveries happen, I don't want to give you the wrong number. Um, we've seen a lot of bad information already in this pandemic. So that's something I don't want to do, but we're happy as deliveries get made to make specific information available. And certainly our embassies across the continent are doing that in partnership with national governments and civil society so that the people have visibility on, on the donations that were being made. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. We move on now to Paul Adepoju. And Paul says, uh, for Dr. John, I'd like to know whether the continent is now testing enough to have more accurate data on the state of the pandemic in Africa, and also what is the latest update on vaccination in Tanzania? So Paul, the, the continent is not testing enough. I mean, as you heard me uh, uh, stated today, we, our test positivity ratio is around uh, nine. So uh, that is the test per case. Uh, I mean, I would like to see it above 10. Okay, that is um, clearly uh, still a shortage there, and we continue to be encouraged that, as you as I indicated earlier, that uh, there was an increase this week. But we like to see a steady increase over time because <clears throat> the foundation for fighting any infectious disease is uh, good testing, and we have to test at, at scale all the time and maintain that level of testing. So we are not yet there, I think, but we are very encouraged with the progress that has been uh, achieved so far. Um, for Tanzania, uh, again, as I said, there are three countries, Tanzania, uh, Burundi, and Eritrea, that um, we are still, uh, uh, we still don't have um, vaccination started there. So that is the, the current situation in uh, with respect to those, uh, uh, those countries there. So um, we encourage all countries to engage in uh, with us. Um, we, are, uh, we, we are here to offer support, technical uh, advice, and technical assistance to countries that are in need of such assistance to start their vaccination program. But I must say that um, Tanzania uh, who, uh, has also joined AVAT and acquired vaccines. I think that is uh, very, very good news and a lot of vaccines for that matter. So uh, we are seeing, uh, it is fair to say that we've now seen a significant shift in, in a, uh, Tanzania's position. So we are here to support them as much as possible, both through ABAD and also through the vaccination program. Thank you very much, John. We move on now to Coletta Wanjohi, who is with uh, FSN. She had two questions, one of which has already been answered, and uh, that was on uh, the status of vaccination supply on the continent. That has been dealt with. But uh, her second question is, 
we see that COVID-19 vaccine producers seeking hubs in African countries, for example, Pfizer in South Africa. What are the dangers of Africa not benefiting from knowledge transfer and just remaining as a production points? Are there any measures to ensure that this doesn't happen? Perhaps let me give that to Mr. Masiwo. Yeah, just to, to pivot, first of all, just uh, something from uh, what my colleague John Kengasan has said. Uh, part of approaching this as the African Union, AVAT and Africa CDC are organs of the African Union. The, the three are not separate. So we, we work together as one. We engage member states to establish where there is a problem. We are pleased to say that Tanzania has become one of the biggest buyers of that vaccines. They have placed a massive order. And uh, we are helping them, working with the World Bank, to get them up to speed. We currently have only two countries, so I'm not here to name and shame. There are only two countries over which we are still facing difficulties to get them to acquire vaccines either because everybody must be vaccinated that is willing to be vaccinated which for us to achieve our 60 percent and by the way on the anti-vaxxer side we've done polling through the africa cdc and we have established that more than 70 percent of african people are willing to take a vaccine if it is made readily available so let us not be drowned by the loud voices of the minority here. Most African people will take vaccines if they are offered. So to, uh, to your final question, sorry, I lost that. Uh, when, remind me again, what was that last piece? Um, she was asking any measures to ensure that Africa does not uh, remain um, just a production point without any knowledge transfer of how to make our own vaccines? Yes, you know, that's, that's a good question. But let me put it this way. Uh, Aspen Pharmaceutical uh, has been, is one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the Southern Hemisphere. It's a big company. It may not, vaccines is just one product. They're a South African company with manufacturing facilities across several African countries. These are well-established African businesses and they are run by Africans. Uh, so to the extent that they have entered into this agreement, uh, they have done so knowing what technology transfer they need to carry out their work. Similarly, the Dakar Institute uh, in Senegal is another major hub that we are pushing. They, they are already able to deliver 16 million doses of vaccines. So the real challenge for us on the vaccine side, if I may say this, on the production side, lest we get, lest we find ourselves running through rabbit warrens, the most important thing on vaccine production is demand. Demand. It is not the ability to produce a vaccine. This we can do pretty quickly. There are industrialists in Africa who would be happy to do it. Aliko Dangote said to, to us, tell us, I will set up a facility in Nigeria tomorrow and we can produce vaccines. Because that isn't the issue here. Uh, the issue is demand, the ability to, if you set up the facility, will there be demand for the vaccines? Right now, the global architecture around how vaccines are purchased would mean that we would not be able to necessarily get orders to those uh, companies. A serum institute, suppliers in India, such as Serum Institute, they get 94% of the orders for African vaccines 
from Gavi and UNICEF. And we've, we've met with Gavi and UNICEF, and we've said, no, this must stop. You've shipped 6 million production jobs to India. We love India, but we love to produce these vaccines here. So what is critical here is for UNICEF, who buys vaccines using donor funding, Gavi, who buy vaccines using donor funding, to place orders with African manufacturers. The manufacturers are here. I can give you a list if you need it, who can ramp up very, very quickly to meet our vaccine production requirements. Yeah, that's the real issue. And by the way, we've met with UNICEF. We met them last this week, and I gave them a very simple challenge. You place $200 million order with an African producer and we'll match you. We're working on that together. So it doesn't, so if, if Pfizer produces in, in South Africa, then we must purchase those vaccines. Who's going to purchase them? UNICEF and AVAT are the only vehicles by which you can purchase, unless they're going to go around country by country trying to find orders. Okay, so we've got to fix the demand side. Uh, without a market, with the market is there, yes, but demand and money is skewed towards buying vaccines in India and bringing them to Africa. That's what we need to deal with. The technology piece is pretty straightforward. All right, thank you very much uh, for that explanation. Uh, for Dr. John, is a question coming up from Rhoda Odiambo of the BBC. She says, right now, governments are pushing for vaccine production. But what about regulation? Where is the Africa Medicines Agency in all these plans that are being made? And what will happen if it will not be able to get enough countries to ratify the treaty to bring it into existence? So thank you, uh, Rodat. Um, let's start with the good news that um, we now have enough countries that have rectified the, the African Medicine uh, Agency. That is very good news. I think that has really not been uh, talked about enough. So that is extremely uh, helpful. Second thing is that <clears throat> we don't need to get AMA or the African Medicine Agency up and running before you do that. You can use individual country capacity. South Africa and other countries have that capacity to uh, produce authoritative regulatory sound opinion uh, to get this vaccine production going. It will be a process. Let's be very clear that building an institution takes time. I mean, the fact that uh, the AMA now has the required uh, 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 signatures for ratification doesn't mean that uh, in the next one uh, month or two months, you get an institution up and running. It will take uh, uh, some time to get it uh, up and running. At the same time, uh, we have national structures that we can rely on. I think that is uh, very important. So I'm very uh, encouraged by the, uh, the word um, you had Stripe describe as the movement in Africa, whether in South Africa, uh, Morocco, Egypt, Algeria, uh, Senegal, and potential Ghana. Rwanda, sorry? Ghana and Rwanda. Ghana and, and, and Nigeria. Very, very encouraged. I think that is just what a kind of movement that we wanted to see on the continent. Now we now to fix uh, uh, the, the, the demand side and also fix the regulatory side. That's why the African uh, initiative, which was launched by President uh, Felix Tshisekedi as the chair of the African Union called the Partnership for African Vaccine Manufacturing is so important. And this afternoon we'll be launching um, that uh, platform uh, with all with key uh, uh, stakeholders there. So I think a lot of good progress uh, with respect to vaccine manufacturing on the continent. Let me just conclude by saying I remain very optimistic that the way and manner in which we'll fight the next pandemic, which obviously will be a next pandemic, will be very different from the way we are fighting this pandemic because of all these developments that we are discussing here and that are taking place on the continent. Thank you yes, very much, John. And John, and, and it's John just to reinforce this so that people don't get hung up. Uh, there's nothing that we need to do with AMA that would delay us on the regulatory front. These are our countries. These are regulations. Give you an example. 
when people said, oh, you don't have uh, uh, AMA yet. So how are you going to issue uh, emergency use authorizations? Dr. John pulled together a committee made up of all the uh, regulators in Africa. And now we issue emergency use authorizations for the whole continent. So we can get through our own regulations. So this is not going to be a barrier. But yes, we will have armor up and running. All right, thank you. We had been given an extra 15 minutes. So perhaps this will be the last question before we then go into the summaries. And it is coming from Duncan Miriri, who has the question, China has rejected a second study on the origins of the virus. What is your reaction, please? Dr. John. So uh, I think WHO is working uh, uh, closely with uh, uh, with a team of scientists to to address that. And I was very I think we should um, let WHO guide the process. Uh, Dr. Tedros was uh, very clear in his uh, comments last week about uh, the need for more cooperation with with with, with uh, China. I think uh, uh, let's let the scientists, the panel of scientists, get to the bottom of of that. Uh, knowing the origin of this, uh, um, the, the, the pandemic is very important because this is the only way that will enable us to prepare for and fight the next pandemic. And we all have to rally behind the WHO so that they have the right uh, authority, the, the empowerment to get to the bottom of, 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 of this. So uh, let's um, uh, uh, stay patient and give the scientists uh, the WHO, the chance to, uh, and the panel that are working on the chance to continue to in investigate and go to the, the root cause of this uh, pandemic, which is uh, uh, a huge uh, the pandemic in the last uh, 100 years for, uh, for all of us. If we don't know the origin, we don't know how it, uh, it originated, it becomes difficult to plan for and enable ourselves to fight the next pandemic. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. John. It's now time for us to go into the summaries. Uh, but before that, let me just say that uh, a number of colleagues had asked a second or third questions, and we have not been able to go through all of them because uh, time was not on our side. So for those colleagues, I wish to advise that um, perhaps you can hold on to the questions until the next briefing, or you can send them in to Nekeron on that uh, WhatsApp number. And that number is uh, plus 251-94-550-2310. That's plus 251-94-550-2310. So let's take the next five minutes uh, to conclude with uh, summaries. Let me start with uh, Mr. Strive Masiwa. In a minute or so, please give us the main points uh, that you would like people to remember from today. We start shipping vaccines that have been purchased from Johnson & Johnson from next week. Uh, uh, it will be a monthly, weekly, it will be a weekly process of shipment to countries. We are setting in place the, the cycles. Uh, we have agreed distribution lists with um, UNICEF. Countries have been notified, and uh, we are very excited that the first shipments will start to reach countries by the end of next week, and we will continue on until our program to deliver 400 million doses is in place. Funding around the vaccines uh, on our side is, is, is looking very good. Uh, the demand from the countries is in excess of what we uh, have purchased, and we are looking for ways to improve on that. We absolutely welcome the decision by Pfizer to join um, uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, to produce on the African soil uh, in partnership with African companies. We are looking to see other announcements very shortly from manufacturers from other parts of the world who are working with companies in Egypt, in Senegal, in Rwanda, in Ghana, and in a number of other African countries 
These are initiatives that we are uh, supporting. We have worked closely with the US government on the allocation of vaccines. Uh, we, uh, we gave them the formula on which to allocate vaccines and they were respectful of our formula. They are using exactly the same formula that we use for member states. We have informed the member states and uh, the American government also has a direct bilateral allocation for which we are not a part. But they have published this on their website. It's there, you can go to the White House website and see it for yourself. Uh, we continue to urge the donor community to come to meet their pledges uh, because we expected a lot more funding to be made available to COVAX than where we are at present. Uh, we are very, very far away from achieving vaccination of our population by December. Uh, and we will need considerable uh, greater effort from the donor community to meet their side of the commitments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, before we move on to the ambassador, let me request both our panelists to please provide their talking points uh, to our team so that it can be shared. We do share the talking points from Dr. John every week. And so we have requests here from colleagues in the media for the talking points of both the ambassador and Mr. Masiwa. All right, now let's move on to Ambassador La Pen for your main talking points uh, from today, the things that you want people to remember. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll pick up. In union on the allocation. I think it is a hugely important point. It is unique in how we are structuring uh, designation and allocation for shared doses. Um, it reflects um, our, I think, our appreciation for the work that the African Union has done, as Strive described. It also reflects um, our appreciation for the USAU partnership. And so uh, the 25 million of the shared doses uh, have begun to roll out um, by the end of this week to about 10 countries. They'll continue to roll over the next few weeks. Um, and then in August, when the AU purchase, when the RVAP um, purchased J and J doses begins, um, we hope to begin also um, distribution on the, the purchased Pfizer from the US. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. We go over to Dr. John for your headline points, please. No, wonderful. I, I think we are here today witnessing the power of partnerships, and that will enable us to achieve uh, uh, the target of immunizing at least 60% uh, uh, of our population by the end of next year, but make sure that <clears throat> we remain <clears throat> remain um, uh, aspirational that by December we should strive to uh, immunize uh, at least uh, up to about 25% of our population. If we do, it will continue this, the power of partnerships there with AVAC, with the bilaterals from the US government and other bilaterals, with COVAX, hopefully remain hopeful that they, will, they, they, they should be able to deliver that. Well, I say this because, I mean, and I believe in this because uh, we are dealing with a pandemic and if we do not want to run into endemicity. We need to strive and, and be bold in trying to get the, this, these targets there. That way, we can rest assured that we do not live with this virus uh, past 2022 and 2023. So I'd really like to uh, that we uh, take what uh, the good news that uh, Strive mentioned today into, uh, and really make sure that the world understand the remarkable progress that is being made uh, through the Africans own leadership efforts there. And the power of partnership speaks to this, the AVAT, the whole concept of AVAT, where leaders like Professor uh, uh, Benedict Orama from the, the Afri Exim Bank, leaders like Dr. Vera Songwe from the Executive Secretary of the uh, UN uh, uh, Economic Commission for Africa, strive coordinating all of it. That is the power of the partnership that I'm referring to that. Uh, the solutions are not coming from the public health 
experts. We are coming from the partnership, very, very broad partnership there, and the political leadership and partnership from President Cyril Ramaphosa. I think that is one. And, uh, and the bilateral partnerships, like the one we are here uh, discussing with the US government and others, we encourage the Europeans and others to join that. That is the, the, the power of partnership and cooperation that will enable us to win this battle against um, uh, COVID-19. That has enabled us to acquire vaccines, but I would also want to see this power of partnership play in the vaccination realm. That way we acquire vaccines and the vaccines get into the arms of people. This partnership cannot, only, cannot end only at the level of acquisition of vaccines, but we would like to see the power of partnership expanded into the vaccination program. That way we can join forces with the MasterCard Foundation uh, efforts to get uh, the vaccines into arms. And lastly, is that vaccines are not the magic bullet as we speak today. It will take time um, to get a, a, a vaccine into people's arms. So probably hurt measures must be practiced. And we need everybody to cooperate. We need the political leadership of the continent to continue to exercise that leadership, avoid uh, political rallies, avoid any opportunities that will offer the, a transmission opportunity for the virus. And I think we need that they continue to support the wearing of masking in public places as much as possible, subsidize that. That is must for now our best vaccines for the continent. So let's not let our guts down and let's continue to make sure that we do all three things together. That is implement public health measures, roll out vaccinations and roll out a vaccination acquisition. I think that is the takeaway message for, from Africa CDC today, but let's celebrate the power of partnership that we, we are, that is being expressed uh, this morning through this platform. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. John of the Africa CDC. And um, let me just thank all our panelists one by one for this uh, very rich content um, that we've had uh, this morning. So let me thank Mr. Strive Masiwa, who is the African Union Special Envoy on COVID-19 and is also the coordinator of the African Vaccine Task um, Acquisition Task Force. Thank you to Her Excellency Jesse LaPen, the head of the United Nations, United States Mission to the African Union. And finally, to Dr. John Nkengasong, our host, who is the director of the Africa CDC. Uh, thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for joining us. And uh, thank you very much to the team behind the scenes for making all this possible. Let's meet again next week on Thursday at the same time. Bye-bye for now.